The entire Palestine solidarity movement in North America has united behind the demand for a ceasefire. For the first time in years, organizations of the working class, including labor unions, have been united against the status quo of Western foreign policy and taken an unprecedented stance against Israeli violence. At the same time, important sectors of the movement have been trying to push the demands even further. The Palestinian youth movement, a major formation of Palestinian youth, all across North America, has been working to push the movement beyond dreaming of an end to current aggression and into demanding full liberation from Israeli occupation. To talk about PYM's latest demands, which include an end to occupation, the release of all Palestinian political prisoners, and an end to Western complicity in Zionism, we're joined by Munir Marwan, who has been a student organizer for Palestine with Students for Justice in Palestine at Tufts University, has worked as a journalist for many years, and is now a leader in the Palestinian youth movement here in New York City. Munir, could you, could you just start by saying, you know, um, a bit about yourself as an organizer and how long you've been in PYM? Absolutely. Um, so my name is Munir. Uh, I'm a member of the Palestinian youth movement. Uh, I've been organizing around Palestine uh, for many years, over 12 years since I was 18, uh, part of my SJP at Tufts University, uh, served in, uh, you know, SJP National for a little while, uh, worked as a journalist for a few years, um, and I've been organizing with the New York chapter of PYM for almost two years now. Palestinian Youth Movement, of course, an organization that exists all across North America, um, they just released a list of demands around this particular um, war on Gaza right now, um, like a really like prominent demand that has come to the fore in North America has been this demand for a ceasefire. But I think it's interesting that the Palestinian youth movement is moving beyond that and talking about what we need beyond just a ceasefire and um, beyond just like stopping aggression. And I'm wondering if you can take us through that list of demands and why it's important to go beyond this initial demand. Um, and if we can just start with, you know, lifting the siege on Gaza and what that means to the organization. Absolutely. Um, you know, we are organizing around demands that um, Palestinians have been asking for for many, many years. Uh, with regards to the siege on Gaza, uh, you know, this is a, a military blockade, um, a suffocating siege that has been in place for over 17 years. Um, and this is a blockade that, uh, you know, literally counts the number of calories that enter Gaza, uh, keeping its population just above the starvation line, uh, you know. So uh, it's completely inhumane. Uh, Israel controls the borders, the, the sea borders, the, the airspace, uh, telecommunications, uh, electricity. Th there's literally no element of life that is outside of their sort of uh, the tyrannical sort of control of this occupation. Um, and that needs to end. It's clear that that situation is untenable. Uh, it's a, it's a pressure cooker. It's a, you know, some people have used the analogy of an open air prison, but some have even said, uh, it's worse than that, you know? So it, you know, this needs to be at the forefront of our thinking around this, because what does it, what does it mean for the, for there just to be a ceasefire? The, the this genocide has displaced over two million people. Um, so where are those people meant to go? Their their homes are destroyed. Uh, apartment blocks have been turned to rubble. We need to start thinking beyond just the inevitable ceasefire uh, as you know the military failures of uh, the the Israeli you know occupation forces uh, has become exposed for the entire world to see. It's interesting how this demand draws attention to a fact that. Uh, many people in the U.S. don't know, right, that Gaza has been under siege for years now, right? Um, that this siege, the latest siege um, that happened, you know, in October is actually not the beginning. Um, and that Israel has been tightly controlling the Gaza Strip for, for many, many years. Absolutely. Um, it's, you know, th these conditions are part of what has sparked Palestinian resistance for so many generations, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen Gazans resist in all sorts of ways, uh, you know, including the Great March of Return, 
uh, which the international community, a, a very powerful movement where, you know, uh, that called attention to the fact that the majority of people living in Gaza are already once displaced, right? They're mostly refugees. Uh, all of them, uh, most of them trace their lineage to areas uh, in, uh, you know, 19, for, in the 1948 borders of Palestine where um, they were displaced from. So these refugees sort of banded together to uh, do a, a nonviolent sort of march to the border to say that, uh, you know, they had a right to to uh, return to their homeland and uh, they were violently suppressed. Uh, they were attacked by Israeli snipers. Um, many were killed. Uh, many were martyred. And, um, you know, so this is this is a cycle. It's clearly a cycle uh, of violence in, in Gaza that um, we need to we need to completely dismantle this this oppressive structure that you know, produces this violence. And I, I also wanted to draw attention to the second demand, which I think is um, extremely crucial, releasing all Palestinian political prisoners. Um, I think a lot right now in the media, in the rhetoric, is this idea of releasing the hostages, releasing the Israeli hostages um, in Gaza. And a lot of what is left out of that rhetoric is the fact that over a thousand Palestinian political prisoners are being held by Israel and have been for many years. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, and that's not spoken about. Um, so if you could talk a bit more about that, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Just to get to that number, there's over 2000 who are held simply without charge or trial. Uh, that's in addition to the many, many other prisoners who are uh, detained on, you know, completely fabricated charges. Um and including minors, who Israel is the only country in the world to uh, try minors in military court. So literally children are being, quote unquote, tried by their military courts. Uh, the, you know, the rate of, uh, you know, the rate of conviction is, it it's, makes it clear that there's absolutely no due process whatsoever. And they're, you know, they're filling their, they're, they're literally raiding people's homes, taking their, uh, you know, families prisoner, and uh, then using that as a sort of bargaining chip um, in their negotiations, right? So it's it's almost, uh, you know, it, it, it's very clear that uh, this is a tool of social control, right? And uh, it's meant to, just as imprisonment is here, uh, break apart families, uh, rupture the social fabric, and uh, collectively punish Palestinians uh, in something that is completely illegal under any kind of uh, humanitarian or international standards. And I think also um, the conditions that these prisoners face in the Israeli state are some of the most appalling, right? And I'm wondering if you can maybe touch a little bit on um, the process of administrative detention, and, you know, some of the um, like real, real hardships that, that these prisoners endure while in Israeli custody. Um. Absolutely. I mean, the there are several Israeli human rights groups that have reported on uh, Israeli and Palestinian and international human rights groups that have reported on the horrendous conditions that Palestinians face within, uh, you know, Israeli captivity. Um one of them is uh, sexual violence, right? There's been, uh, you know, many, many reports of sexual assault, uh, rape, and uh, sort of using this horrendous tactic as a as a means of punishment and uh, and essentially uh, terror, you know, striking terror into the hearts of uh, of the of a you know occupied population. Uh, nonetheless, you know, Palestinian prisoners, they have served as sort of the compass of our movement. They are a guiding force in our sort of uh, intellectual thought. Um, later this year, uh, uh, the PYM intends to publish a novel, actually, by one of the Palestinian uh, prisoners, a writer who has been imprisoned for so many uh, years. Um, and we're, we're very much looking forward to sort of translating his uh, renowned Arabic novel into English for a, a wider sort of uh, reader base. That's really, really exciting to hear. Um, definitely like 
how the cultural aspect plays into the broader movement, um, especially in the Palestinian struggle. There's such a history of that. Um, you know, I also wanted to talk about um, the third demand, um, ending the occupation. Um, you know, I think this is has been quite a prominent one for, um, you know, many years. And I think it's important to bring it back to the fore. Um, you know, and I, I do wanted to, I, I wanted to speak about this a little bit, but also, you know, express that, you know, PYM is an organization that has not lost sight of the fact that there is this ongoing occupation. It really is not just about um, the ongoing genocide right now. It's this ongoing unjust situation that led to all of this violence. So um, yeah, if we could just speak on that for a little bit. Right. Absolutely. You know, while while uh, a, a genocide rages on uh, at the hands of the you know the Israeli military in Gaza, there is also an occupation that has been festering in the West Bank. Uh, you know, Gaza is also under occupation, but this year has been one of the deadliest years and on record for Palestinians living in the West Bank. We've seen increased settlement expansion, settler violence. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, raids into deep into Palestinian territory. Um, and, uh, you know, this all points to the fact that the Israeli occupation uh, has become increasingly untenable. And when we say end the occupation, we mean this this entire system of coercion, control and dominance has to be dismantled, you know, and this has to be dismantled uh, not only because uh, you know, Palestinians are suffering, but Israelis are suffering under the system too. You know, it's uh, it, it's bizarre for a society to take its 18-year-olds and draft them, conscript them into military service where they are put in a position where they have to inflict cruelty and violence on, uh, you know, a captive population. This is something that is tormenting for the psyche. Um, I see that you have a poster of Franz Fanon behind you. And, you know, in The Wretched of the Earth, uh, Fanon talks about the impact of torture and um, this kind of violence, not simply on the psyche of the colonized, but also on that of the colonizer. Um, so, you know, it, it's of utmost importance that the international community recognize that this occupation is completely unsustainable. Um, and it is the one of the fundamental things that needs to change in order for there to be any kind of justice uh, from the river to the sea. You know, the importance of of the context of what's been happening um, is very, very crucial. And I, I'm glad that you brought it back to the West Bank because there have been killings in the West Bank um, in this period of time, even like the most recent two months. Um, and that is just like how the violence spills over to all of occupied Palestine is definitely important to note. Um, and of course, there is um, a demand that we hear a lot in the US about the Western complicity um, in Zionism, the fact that Western governments, including in the United States and Canada, fund Israel with billions of dollars in weapons. Um, can you talk about that? And can you talk about, you know, the impact of that on the working class of this country? Uh, we need to be, you know, we need to be very clear that the, the Western world is the largest the single largest enabler of uh, the regime, the the sort of occupation and colonization of Palestine. Uh, and they're not doing this because they've decided that this is some kind of moral stance. Uh, they're not doing it out of charity. They're doing it because they're deeply complicit in and profiting from uh, this ongoing militarization and and uh, and genocide of, of Palestinians. Um, arms companies, Western arms companies, Western tech companies, are deeply complicit in uh, upholding this uh, system of, you know, weapons sales uh, to Israel. When the United States, uh, you know, allocates billions of dollars um, to this, uh, to, to funding the, you know, to, to aiding, quote unquote, the, the Israeli military, a lot of that money is being used to purchase uh, American arms, right? Weapons that are manufactured here and shipped there. Uh, in order to, you know, uh, destroy entire apartment buildings, wipe out families, um, you know, even their the sort of tech exports, uh, artificial intelligence is being used in this genocide like never before. Um, 
So, you know, Western complicity is, is the fundamental enabler of this entire situation. Uh, the rest of the world sees this quite clearly. Uh, you know, this occupation is deeply unpopular among the global South and, um, you know, where in most places that are not, uh, you know, as the West is profiting off of this. Um, so, you know, when we say when ending Western complicity, um, we mean sort of dismantling that system. Um, so, you know, this demand is something that should resonate across uh, working class communities uh, domestically in the United States. It's quite absurd that when this society, this government hasn't fulfilled some of the most fundamental and basic needs of its own people, such as health care, you know, uh, a proper social safety net, right, uh, infrastructure that is decaying and crumbling, uh, that they're literally spending billions of taxpayer money uh, to fund this, uh, you know, literal genocide that is happening across the world. There's zero tangible benefit for the average American. Um, and, you know, not to mention that it's, of course, a horrendous atrocity that we are literally funding. You know, going off of that, there have been these mass protests across North America in the United States in major, you know, capitalist centers like New York City and also in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., where all of this funding is generated, essentially. Um, can you speak to like this moment right now in the movement for Palestine where we have people in the working class of the countries that most support Israel? are very clearly saying that they don't support this in huge numbers. Yeah. You know, what I think we're seeing is people paying attention to this issue like never before, right? And when people pay attention to this, it's quite clear that something isn't adding up, uh, you know, and that uh, something is deeply wrong, right? Uh, it also points to the incredible undemocratic nature of the society we live in. Uh, you know, while the U.S. pretends to be, uh, you know, the world's, you know, most established democracy, uh, the reality is that uh, over 80 percent of Democrats and over 60 percent of even Republicans support a ceasefire, which is one of our most basic demands and longstanding demands in this conflict. Um, yet our politicians are completely cowardly when it comes to actually reflecting the desires of their constituents, right? Um, it's uh, it's a political class that has grown wealthy on corruption and uh, does not reflect the actual needs and desires of the people. So, you know, in addition, when we say that Palestine will free us all, that's a chant that we're hearing on the streets. That also refers to the fact that we need systemic change in this country where we live. We need uh, you know, uh, working class uprising and uh, essentially a, a revolution, a, a political revolution that uh, will make our systems truly democratic, right? There's obvious common sense reforms that, uh, you know, need to, to need to happen. Uh, but the political establishment is, you know, too afraid to allow that to happen. Uh, and they, you know, they're using every dirty tactic uh, in the book, but uh that fun they fundamentally cannot win because uh, it's clear that the people are united behind this cause like never before. Uh, we're seeing an anti-war movement uh, along the lines of, uh, you know, the, the anti-war movement during Vietnam. It's, it's a, um, a movement that is only escalating in its, uh, you know, reach and people power. And it's something that, uh, you know, has created bonds and solidarities that, uh, are unprecedented, right? Try, quite, quite literally unprecedented in this country. So, uh, you know, we we have every uh, belief that we will triumph in this, and that Palestine will contribute to the freedom uh, of of the countries that you know are are of the governments that are funding this uh, genocide. You know, we're seeing today uh, mass mobilizations on a scale that is really unprecedented in U.S. history. Uh, it's not just this, you know, not just the scale of the of the marches over over half a million people, uh, you know, descended on Washington, D.C. early in this process to demand a ceasefire um, in a march that was organized by PYM and a huge coalition of comrades. Uh, but we're also seeing constant disruptions on a daily basis, acts of civil disobedience, 
disruptions of, you know, fundraising events for the Israeli military, uh, confrontations of politicians, uh, spontaneous actions that are being planned by, uh, you know, groups of concerned, uh, you know, comrades who are coming together to uh, oppose this, uh, you know, horrific war machine. And the the scale of the the protests is it's nonstop. You know, the even we recently heard um, from a journalist who was interviewing uh, a member of law enforcement that um, the police, the NYPD, one of the biggest, by far the biggest police department in the country, is uh, feeling stretched very thin and strained by the uh, amount of protests happening, and that officers are literally unable to keep up with the long hours, um, getting fatigued from standing on their feet, uh, hear our chants in their heads as they're trying to fall asleep and know that they have to wake up the next morning to another massive protest. Um, so that's really inspiring that that is being seen by people in Palestine and across, uh, you know, across the world, across, across the global South. And that's inspiring even more acts of solidarity, courage, bravery, and sacrifice. Uh, and we hope to keep seeing that as uh, as time continues. Thank you so much for making the time for this. Um, that was excellent.